Welcome to the Latched On Podcast. The Latched On Podcast is about the outdoors in Appalachia. Everything from hunting, fishing, camping, hiking, bushcraft, and woodsmanship. And digging into the depths of what makes this area of Appalachia so unique as a whole. It's time to strap in for the Latched On Podcast. thing that I um, started doing last early fall before hunting season and during hunting season, I would do what I call a cold shot. And Mm -hmm. what I would do is I would, like say, if I was off that day, I would come right out here. I would say, all right, when's the last time I saw a deer? Okay. I saw a deer in the backyard, 35 yards away. Mm -hmm. So I go out 35 yards from the target, Mm -hmm. a 3d target, pull back, shoot. Yep. Wherever the arrow lands, I look at it and I deal with that. Hold yourself like, hold yourself accountable to that. Hold yourself accountable. You leave that arrow like if I hit a gut shot, back thigh, whatever shot, I leave it there and then I don't come back to that target until the afternoon. And that's when I start practicing. Yep. What can I do to fix that? Yeah. What can I do to that? Because when you're deer hunting, are you shooting six, seven times before you shoot that deer? No. No. It's your yep. first shot of the day, and you haven't shot no more before that. Now, don't get me wrong. I bought a little what they call a, a discharge mm-hmm. target for crossbows. Yeah. I bought it, and every time, like, I either go hunting for, like, an overnight or something like that, yep. I'm taking it with oh, me. Oh, absolutely, so yeah. So I can practice when exactly. I'm not hunting. Yeah, and then making sure it's still sided in, tuned in, exactly. and everything. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, that's always a thing that I've always had luck with is that cold shot and – Funny thing about it is most of the deer I see is within 20 yards. So I'm like, well, am I really challenging myself at 20 yards? And I'm like, well, re- realistically speaking, I wasn't going to get my, my limits 30 yards. Like I know a lot of people go 40 yards, mm-hmm. but I don't trust myself past 30. Mm-hmm. And that's just me. Because well, see, that's good, though. You're holding yourself accountable to what you know you do. can do. And that's the way you need to be. We had this conversation, I think, what was it, like second day of rifle season. We went in there and we were talking about, crossbows i got nothing against crossbows some people use them because they have shoulder issues or handicap and all that stuff Mm -hmm. um they're a lot user friendly they're not less labor intensive as compound bows so i'm not getting into that debate and that discussion but i bought a crossbow one year just simply because of the fact is i didn't have enough free time available to practice with my compound yeah and that's what i'm diehard bow guy and uh i'm like i said don't I don't, I'm not going to disrespect anybody that uses a crossbow whether you're handicapped or not. Um, however, I would rather you take a crossbow if you're not going to take the time exactly to do it. Cause I would rather you hunt ethically than, mm-hmm. than try to do something half. Yeah. Don't half, be, half don't done, be so. peer pressured into using a compound bow just cause everybody else is doing it. Yeah. And then make a bad shot and never find a deer. Yep. Which that's another podcast thing about taking how to become a better shot in general mm-hmm. about bow because we could talk for hours about how to the process the, the whole process. thing yeah yeah that's that will be that'll be like a summer podcast when we're actually that's all we're doing there's nothing to oh, hunt yeah. and uh, we're working on that the uh but yeah now's it now's a great time to get that arrow set that new arrow set up you wanted like i said i like the method archery ones they were they're pretty cool because if you're not into building your own arrows they come fully built custom to what you want. That's why I lean toward those. Um, so when you order, you get on there and order, you put in all your bows information, your poundage, your draw length, everything. They glue in your inserts. They, they come with field tips. You can pick three or four fletched, what kind, what size fletching. They ship to your door ready to shoot, mm-hmm. which is pretty sweet. Um, but I'm also looking at a set of the Victory Rip TKOs. And if you're in the archery industry or into it, or you've been looking into it, you're going to know that, um, that's a big, that's like, that's what a lot of people shoot for is those, those arrows right there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just recently got a fletching and jig and so I'm going to order them cut, but I'm going to build them myself. So minus the, uh, cutting them, I'm going to glue my inserts in. How they fly. Yep. And uh, I'm interested. They're a little bit lighter grain per inch than my methods are. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I can, I can achieve a little bit of a lighter arrow. And I know there's a huge debate over light over heavy. Um, I'm not going to argue both kill deer, both kill animals. So Mm -hmm. 
I'm not going to disagree with anybody. They want to shoot a, a 550 to a 600 grain arrow, um, but I'm shooting a 460 right now with that, uh, with those method arrows. And I mean, I'm, and I'm just now getting it sighted in, but I've been, I have to sight in at 60 yards. And I mean, I had a group the other day. It was, and I hadn't shot in a while because I hadn't shot since the early season, uh, during deer season. And I was shooting about a softball size group at 60 yards with those and they're flying pretty consistent. Um, but that's what I want to do. So, um, but when it, and I'm shooting, like I said, a 460, if I move to those rip TKOs, I can either put some more, and this is the tinkering part of it. I can throw some more weight up front and I can get a higher FOC and keep my weight, my total arrow weight around that 460 range. And I can increase my, my FOC by like probably a couple percent because I'm at 11.9 right now. FOC with those arrows at a 460 grain, which is not the highest FOC that a lot of people shoot for. Most people are shooting from that 12 to 15 right. and I'm just shy of 12. Um, so I could keep my arrow weight about the total weight of 460 with those rip TKOs with 25 extra grains up front. And then I'll be running the 460 grain total weight, but my FOC will probably bump up to like a 13 something or maybe close mm -hmm. to 14. I haven't done the calculation on it or I can leave the front end weight the same because the overall weight of the arrow is lighter grain per inch i can be running like a four uh 436 grain arrow so i can shave almost 30 grains yeah. off the whole weight so yeah, my big thing is the arrows that i use and they're not no name brand one because i just buy arrows just because they were they're like 350 grain mm -hmm. arrows and i think because of that i've used mechanical heads over broad heads because mm -hmm. i'm concentrating on yeah i don't have a lot of punch behind it mm -hmm. well that's probably your weight before your broadheads as well yeah it was yeah and so then 100 grain i put 100 grain broadheads on there so i'm yeah. pushing about 450 yeah arrow total with broadhead and everything mm -hmm. i use the old trackers because i mean they're cheap and they're reliable okay that's uh, yeah um, but i do have the good old reliable thunderhead broadheads too that yeah. i I sometimes keep at least one arrow with the broadhead in my quiver, but uh, usually I've been running them uh, them swackers. And a big reason is is just you know if I'm a little bit off on a shot, those things open up enough of where they're going to cut something. Yeah, they got a pretty wide wide cut. A lot of people like those swackers for turkey hunting as well. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people recommend a, a mechanical broadhead for a turkey because those feathers are are a lot tougher than most people think. Mm -hmm. And that armor, you know, it'll help those uh, expandables expand. You know, it I've helps them do people, what they're supposed to do. I've seen some people use mechanical broadheads. I think they were using the schwackers and it like decapitated turkeys. Like they were so good oh, at the shot that they would shoot at the head and it would just cut the head off. Yeah, they got them uh, guillotine broadheads too that are pretty yeah. wild for the turkeys. But I didn't want to do that because then I'd have to get a whole another arrow set up for that broadhead yeah. and then get some like flu flu. Totally understandable. Yeah. So I, I was going to do that. Um, that's another thing. After I get this other set of arrows, I've been looking at broadhead selection. And that's a huge mm -hmm. thing when it comes to hunting as well. And I'm, uh, I'm leaning away from mechanicals. And that's just a personal choice of mine. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, um, and, you know, the and we're going to stick with the Eastern side of things. Cause I can't speak for the Western side. I do watch a lot of Western guys cause they take archery so serious, but I can't speak on hunting elk cause I've never hunted an elk, but most people recommend no mechanicals on elk yeah. uh, just yeah. for their, Actually, their own reasons. There's some States. I know that Colorado, I'm, I could be totally wrong on this, but I think I watched it somewhere that mechanical heads are actually illegal. A lot of states they are because um, they, they don't like, uh, cause there's a, and people, I mean, I know some people will die on that hill of mechanicals work every time, but there's, mm -hmm everything can fail right anything oh, yeah. mechanical is going to be more likely to fail mm -hmm. um and i'm just personally leaning away from that um so last year I, I did have a set of rages i actually didn't get a deer with my bow last year um uh took a few shots uh which i'll go into something well actually real quick tactical tip here uh when you're in your stand as soon as you get in your standard side i don't care what you use pull your bow draw your bow back mm -hmm. as soon as you put an arrow on it draw your bow back and move around I didn't do that, and it costed me to miss a deer. I had two deer. I actually had three different opportunities on the same doe when I was in a meat crisis. I'm trying to fill the freezer, and three different opportunities, which is unheard of anyway. Mm -hmm. Three different opportunities on the same in the same instance, the same instance so like hunt. Me like that deer was just asking for it. And yeah, she wasn't. The, she wasn't very pressured. It was a, a yeah. doe I'd left alone for a while. It was on uh, some property, mine. and so she kind of. And I hadn't been there, so it was very new to her that somebody was there. But I didn't draw my bow back. I, long story short, my drop away rest, the drop cord, got hung around the backside of the uh, the drop away rest. So when I drew my bow back, 
it pulled the string through the serving and it threw the drop away rest out of time. Mm. And uh, so, like I said, long story short, so once the the arrow fell off of it twice because it had too much tension on it and as the safety thing it fell it, the it, the arrow rest will drop away and then finally i figured out that the cord was tight pulled around i fixed the cord but i didn't know that it messed the timing up so then i took a 42 yard shot at a doe which i was com- completely comfortable with making on a normal basis um but because the timing was off my arrow uh the drop away rest didn't drop so my arrow smacked it and shot up mm. and shot above her, which I'm perfectly okay with because yeah. I would rather miss her completely than wound her. That's um, much better than miss than wound. Yeah. yeah so, and, and I'm not going to blame my equipment and say, oh, it's my equipment's fault. I did that. Um, it was my fault because I didn't draw back my bow to make sure. Because if it did, I would have noticed something was out of whack and I could have either tried to fix it in the stand, noticed that it was out of timing and then I could have pulled out of that hunt or um, with the way I had it set up, I could have fixed it in the stand. Um, the way I had that set up. So that's just a little tactical tip. I always draw back. Um, I got on the side thing there. Yeah, I am leaning more towards fixed blade. Um, just cut on contact broadheads. Uh, I just ordered a set of the iron wheel single bevels and got been, those in. I've been looking at those too. And that's one of the things that I kind of, it sounds like probably an oxymoron or something that's impossible to do. I don't know if it's impossible to do, but it's probably very difficult to do. But it's one of those things that I want to be able to get an arrow with a mechanical head, put it on my bow, shoot an Eastern, you know, East coast deer, because mm-hmm. let's just, you know, it's less to track. I'd rather it bleed more. And then, but like say, hypothetically, I go to Colorado mm-hmm. next year, go for an elk hunt over a counter elk hunt or something like that. Yep. Can't use mechanical heads. So I want a broad head that's going to take down an elk, mm-hmm. but I don't have to change my shooting whole setup. at all. You don't have to change your whole setup. Yeah. I just want to be able, I, like, I literally want to be able to screw off the mechanical tip, put on a broad head and nothing change. Mm-hmm. And that's what, uh, yeah. So when, that's why people, and mechanicals are popular for a good reason. Um, it took less tuning. Mm-hmm. It took a whole lot less tuning to get your, um, your mechanicals cause they're shaped because when the blades are folded in, it's shaped a lot more like a field point. So mm-hmm. they fly a lot more like a field point, which makes sense. Yeah. Um, and that's great for people, you know, and like I said, people, I know people kill thousands and thousands of deer um, and people kill elk. I've seen people kill elk with, uh, with mechanicals. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying they don't work. Um, and that's a nice that you don't have to tune them. But my idea was, is I'm this year, I plan on going through some different broadheads, some cut on contacts. And I want to find that one that I want to tune my bow to. And I can go anywhere in the U.S. and I can hunt anything I want with it. Exactly. So that's what I, that's my goal, and that's what I, I like to tinker, and I like that. Like uh, like I said before, I always be tinkering. But I'm trying to find. I don't have the money to just buy every sweet broadhead that's mm-hmm. out there. And those iron wheels ain't cheap. That is probably the most expensive broadhead on the market. Um, but I bit the bullet because I know it's a solid broadhead. Right. Um, and a buddy of mine, he just ordered some annihilator broadheads as well, and they're cut on contact. They're supposed to be extremely strong and uh good quality and it's a three blade and the uh, iron wheels are a two blade with bleeders so some people call it a two blade some people call it a four just depends mm-hmm. um but i'm going to try he's going to let um when we tune his bow to his annihilators i'm going to also shoot the annihilator with through mine and see how my setup locks it um but i'm going to tune it and i'm going to run those probably just strictly run the iron wheels definitely because i paid for them but it, i like the fact too though is because i did shoot a deer with the uh, the rage hypodermic two blade Mm-hmm. I've shot a doe and cut clean through two rib bones, mm-hmm. um, and she died within 40 yards, without a doubt. And she it was a, it was, I mean, it looked like a horror movie scene right yeah. on the way to her. It was great. She died ethically. Um, I also shot a doe and shot a little far back, a little low, and hit her in a brisket. It broke a blade off, lost the arrow. It didn't it wasn't a pass through, and that head was just a not like it just. And I, I'm pretty sure, and unfortunately, I wounded that deer, but I'm pretty sure she lived, without a doubt, she lived, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and that was what I was already talking about, or I was already in my head just debating on going strictly to the fixed blade. And then once mm-hmm. I hit that because dough. Even, like, if, even if it doesn't open a big gaping wound like a mechanical does, it's got that mass and that cut behind it of where. Yep. Like, I know the biggest fear of a mechanical broadhead is that scapula bone. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you can, that's how you can so scare a mechanical broadhead. Head. Exactly. Punch through that thing like it's paper. Yep, that's what and uh, Iron Wheel have done, and that's what they're one of their sayings is is uh, accurate as science allows, mm-hmm. and that's because they they've done test after test, and I've watched them shoot those through scapulas and watched them shoot like a femur bone, and it mm-hmm. glanced off and didn't it didn't harm the head, and the femur bone actually just broke off like into. It was, I mean, they're they're solid, and that's what they're made for. They're made to be tough. 
they're not stainless like most heads are. And I know that's, you have to be willing to put in the time because they're not stainless. So they are going to be willing to rust. Mm -hmm. So when I ordered them, I went ahead and ordered their blade care kit, mm -hmm. which is like a, a little, uh, it's a stone, but it's not a sharpening stone. It's like a 1200 grit stone to get off any wear places if they want to try to rust. And, uh, and then it's like a paint pen that has mineral in it. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, Coat them so coat they the it keeps them. Yep, keeps thing. them from rusting. So you got to put in that effort. And if you don't want to do that, don't worry about it. You can get the annihilators, which are stainless, and they're not going to mm -hmm. rust. Um, I tried the Muzzy Ones last year. Um, the Muzzy One actually flew really, really well, um, tuning wise. It flew very, very close to what a um, fill point did. The only thing I didn't like is the point was a point. It was a pointy tip, but that thirty-three degree blind or grind on it took me forever to get a decent sharp edge and I never got them razor sharp. Hmm. And I understand some people care more about the, the integrity of the blade than they do the sharpness of the blade but, because like the rages, like their little razor blades. Yeah, they cut great, but like I, I hit that deer in the brisket and it broke that blade right off right. without a doubt. That so muzzy one wouldn't have happened. Exactly. So that muzzy one or the annihilators, for instance, uh, or even the iron wheels, you're looking at, okay, it might not be razor sharp, but it's got that uh, blade integrity to where at least it doesn't break off immediately if I hit it in the scapula and it's going to keep penetrating and it, mm -hmm. it's going to cause damage. So it's all those things. And that's just where you geek out. And you get so, I mean, like, like a, pretty much what we're figuring out is, is if you want to be a good archer, especially with the compound, you got to practice all year. Yeah. Um, I would always recommend um if you have a local archery club that's indoor shooting range and all that stuff, it's a good way to shoot without having to deal with 30, 20 degree temperatures in January mm -hmm. and February. Because even though we've had some warm spells here and there, it doesn't hurt to shoot indoors. And plus, if you're shooting with other people, it helps with that anxiety factor also. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to be a bad shot around other people, but yeah. it puts that pressure on you mm -hmm. of where you focus on it. Yeah, and you can do like, um, just you can make up games. You can, you yeah. know, ne next bet, you know, next best shot buys coffee tomorrow yeah. or, you know what I mean? Or, you know, yeah. just little stuff like that. You can set up little baby tournaments in your backyard mm -hmm. with your buddies at cookouts and stuff and, and do that. And then you can rely on each other to help you because even as much as I practice and, and believe that I'm a pretty good shot, um, Andrew might walk up and be like, Hey, you're, you know, you just punched that trigger. You need to watch yourself. And he's mm -hmm. watching that or cause he's seen it from the side and he's not the one mm -hmm. behind the trigger. Or like maybe you're, uh, like you, you always have those little tabs on you that like every time you draw back, it always touches your nose and mm -hmm. you know your rounds up. Well, maybe it's a little off and you didn't notice it because you're adrenaline spiking, but your buddy may point mm -hmm. out and say, Hey, watch your form next time you, you know, you drew back and you weren't lined up with your side. Like, yep. Like yeah. That's a huge or, thing. I will mention, uh, just out there to, if you're getting into it, find your points of contact where that string touches your face mm -hmm. and you want as you want minimal string pressure, which means it's not pushing on that string. Um, and you want the same contact points every time and you want them in the same way. Consistency. Uh, can, very consistent. Yeah. Consistency kills. So, um, you want that string, like for me, it touches the very tip of my nose and I make sure it touches there the same time every time. Mm -hmm. Some people like kisser buttons. If you like kissers, use a kisser button. If you don't know what that is, just look it up. Um, whatever works for you, everybody's different. And that's the thing is there's not the way I shoot, uh, my bow is different than how Andrew shoots his bow, but we have to accomplish the same task. So when we shoot together, we can, we can help uh, um, regulate each other and be like, Hey, you know, you had too much string pressure or, Hey, you pulled the, the string past your tip of your nose instead of touching the tip. Yeah. Just those little things like he was saying. It's always good to have somebody, especially like me and Zach, yeah. where we, we hunt with bows. And then, like I said, every time we want to shoot and like, we can just say, Hey, you want to shoot some, you want to shoot some bow, with some archery or whatever. And I can either go down to his house, he can go to my house, or we can go to an archery range somewhere, like mm -hmm. a 3D course that we have locally up near Clintwood. And, and uh, it's $10 to shoot, shoot it. And they got 3D, 3D targets ranging right. anywhere from 20 to 50 yards to 60 yards. So, mm -hmm. and they got an indoor archery range and everything. So it's one of those things like you can always, if you have a group of people that you can hunt with or you like to shoot with, um, use that creative constructive criticism to help each other out and you practice perfect, kill perfect. Mm -hmm every time I mean, it's not just practice makes perfect it's perfect practice makes perfect mm -hmm. it's that simple so wrapping it all up it's all about consistency staying in practice don't get out of that practice and use every opportunity to 
practice with your bow as you can. Try your cold shots in the morning and then come back in the afternoon and shoot regular. Find your points of contact. And that's pretty much, it's it's scratching the surface, but I mean, a lot of those little hit tips will help you out in the long run of becoming a better marksman with your bow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then like I said, if you do decide to get into that, that uh, like Andrew said at the beginning, uh, it opens up your hunting season. If you love hunting, then you just get more time to hunt that way. And then in like Virginia, we're pretty liberal about how much you can hunt with your archery equipment because mm-hmm. I don't muzzle it or hunt. I it's archery. Only, hunt. It's only two weeks out of the entire hunting season you can not hunt with a bow. You still can. They change. You it. still can. You can okay, now. You yeah. Can. So uh, <laughs> you have to. The only thing is for rifle. No. So the way you can't Virginia, shoot, you just can't shoot a doe within those exactly. Two weeks. That's what. So it yep, and you have to wear hunter orange the entire time. Mm-hmm. So uh, way Virginia is, we have a very long uh, early archery, and then we go into uh, early muzzleloader. Uh, I choose, and you can if it's up to you. You can hunt with your bow through muzzleloader. Um, you don't have to wear orange unless you want to during muzzleloader and then you can still harvest a doe with your bow during muzzleloader even if it's a buck only like our county is for early muzzleloader you can't hunt a buck but with your bow you can you can hunt does but you can't hunt a buck i'm sorry you can't hunt a buck with your you can't hunt a doe with your muzzleloader unless it's a doe designated day or Mm -hmm. in a certain county locality but you can shoot this like i could go in with a muzzleloader zach go in with his bow Mm-hmm. I see nothing but a doe in front of me. He can shoot it. I can't. Yep. That yep. Simple? And that's what, I mean, it just depends on what you want and what you're after. Um, but I mean, you could be like me and I was an early muzzleloader, um, but I had my bow with me and a buck was chasing a doe. They were already, it was, uh, they're starting to rut pretty good. He was uh, running a doe and she, I, they were, they, obviously they come from the side. I didn't think they were going to come from like it always happens. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> the doe got downwind of me before the buck did and he stopped it he never even knew i was there but he stopped at 58 yards which was just outside my the range i wanted to shoot and uh, at a whitetail anyway and uh, the doe didn't really know what was up she didn't know where i was at but she got a weird wind she didn't like mm-hmm. so she just turned around she didn't spook hard she bounded back about 10 yards and then walked back and then she just trotted back the way she came but she never spooked bad and the buck just was like okay we're going this way now he literally turned around at 58 <laughs> yards and walked right behind her and he was a good size buck. He was a he was a decent seven or eight point. Um, Chasing that tail. That's yeah, that yeah, tail that's now. what he was doing. But uh, you know, with the muzzleloader, he'd have been, I'd have smoked him. He'd have never knew it hit him. Oh yeah. And uh, so that's just the the trade off. Um, and I could have tried to shoot the doe. She come in, but she was through some thick stuff, so I wouldn't have been able to shoot her anyway. Um, but yeah, so I, like I said, archery you can you get a lot more time you can mm-hmm. hunt with archery equipment if you and want even to. After rifle season uh, ends, which usually is the beginning of December, late November. Uh, in Virginia, you have late archery kicks mm-hmm. in literally the day after. Yep. And the best thing about that is the first two weeks of December, you can only shoot late archery. Yep. Late muzzle doesn't kick in until yep. mid December. So nobody's going to be in the woods. That Except last those archery guys. Except now archery you're hunting guys. a lot of pressure deer right after rifle yeah. season. You're hunting pressure deer. However, you have that, you get another chance of just you and your fellow archers in the woods, and which is awesome. And like no disrespect to Tennessee, one of my best best friends and hunting buddies out of Tennessee, he uh, is when the rifle season comes in, it stays in the rest of the year, mm-hmm. and that's rough now, on them. Now there is some counties in Virginia that are like that. Like I know on the East Coast, in some counties where they have high density deer populations, especially in these urban ish areas, especially out east, mm-hmm. they have rifle season kicks in. I think in October. Oh, really? Uh, until the end of the year. I can't be for yeah. sure on that. The book's real regulated. But in our specific zone, rifle season is dedi- is um, dictated pretty much by county. But I think Wise, Dickinson, and Buchanan County, which is ironically the same elk management zone that they've released elk in and all that stuff around here, they usually keep their seasons pretty consistent with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're pretty even close. Lee County, which is down toward the Cumberland Gap, is semi consistent with Wise County. They just have a few doe days sprinkled in here and there. Yeah, Lee County's well, uh, they have a lot less public land as well, though. Yeah. It's mostly farmland. So unless you know somebody, you don't have to worry about yeah, that. Most as much. of their only public land that's able to be hunted is actually borders Wise County. Yeah. And, and then uh, Scott County's got quite a bit too. Scott, it's, it's Scott County's further got south. a lot of national forest on the north side of it, but the rest of it's all farmland. Yep. Yeah, the yeah. Scott County is also similar to Lee County. It's pretty much the same regulations as mm-hmm. Wise County, but like I said, you got a few private land um, addendums in there that you can hunt 
does with a muzzleloader or ruffle season on mm-hmm. these on, on private land and without a specific doe day. I think Dickinson County has two doe days and Wise County only has one doe day, which yeah. is the last day of the season. Yep. And then they and change Dickinson, that every year too. Some, yeah, some years they do, some years they don't. Last year, I think it was last year they actually, or the year before last, they actually did Dickinson County one day of muzzleloader season in the early muzzleloader season. It was mm-hmm. usually the second Saturday in November. Mm-hmm. And that was just a new concept that they issued in. And I'm like, why don't they do a doe day for rifle season? That'd yeah. be nice. Because all we have is does. Yeah. But anyway, wrapping it all up, uh, we could talk about this stuff for hours and we could try and stay on subject. But like I said, wrapping it all up, archery is a thing to talk about. Go to your local pro shop, figure out what's going on. Shoot, a bunch shoot, of bows. shoot different bows. It doesn't matter what brand. Shoot different bows. Yeah. You, um, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a flagship bow or not. Shoot if the cheap ones, shoot the expensive ones. With a PSE Nova, shoot it. Yep. If you're comfortable with a uh, Hoyt, shoot it. If you're comfortable with a Matthews and you're willing to put down the money for a Hoyt or a Matthews, mm-hmm. put it down. Whatever you're comfortable with shooting and whatever you shoot best is what I'd recommend getting. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't matter what brand. That's why I, I love my Matthews, and I'll probably stick with them for a while. But that's because I shoot them well. I mean, I shoot, I shoot, I shoot it better than what I did my Hoyt. So yeah, that's why we're sticking with it. Fun. And then uh, we'll uh, we'll definitely during the summer we'll probably give an archery update. Maybe what kind of stuff we're settling in on when it comes to to bows and arrows. And then maybe right before season we can do a short I think one. We could. I think we could do a podcast just about bows. And we would never run out of stuff. Oh, no, absolutely not. I wouldn't. I know that for sure. Um, but right before season starts, I think we can do one and uh, and go over our exact setup. Oh, exactly. Uh, the whole bow, maybe even do a video podcast on that one. Yeah, like August and uh, – we could probably record about August or July because that by that time we'll probably have it fine-tuned. We'll be dialed in, yeah. Yep. And we'll do uh, literally everything on it from our release to our site to our stabilizer. If you're going to change anything – in September, right before postseason. Don't do that. <laughs> don't. Do just just it. don't do that. And now, if you're if you're if your adjustment. old if your old bow breaks in two and you have to, okay. But yeah. other than that, and at that point, just get it good to forty or thirty and in. Mm-hmm. And if that's a that's just a little tip. If you if something goes wrong right before season starts, go grab. Uh, unless you have the money, go get whatever you want. But go grab a. You know, you can get a bear um, legion. I think it's the bear legion bow or something for like two hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. Yeah, and it's got side. It's got three pin side. And I mean, I'm anyway. not saying, I'm not saying I always advocate buy a local, no matter what, but yeah. you can find bear archery bows on Amazon for yeah. like $230, $250. Yeah. Get one of those, get it sided into 30 yards and get you yep. and, and just go and just do that. But don't, don't try to change up. Don't wait till September to change. Yeah. At least start in like May, uh, May, June timeline. It gives you plenty of time to dial it in. So, yeah. well. Guys, appreciate y'all listening to it. We're nerded out a little bit about Bo. It's what we like talking about. We'll talk about more stuff in future episodes. You know, I hope y'all keep listening and uh, catch y'all next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Latch Tom Podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. Our episodes come out every two weeks, so stay tuned for the next one, and we hope to see you all next time.